Well, good evening. Um, I'm Martin Tyner with the Southwest Wildlife Foundation. And of course, everybody knows my beautiful friend here. This is Belle, and she's a Harris Hawk. And uh, Belle's one of our wildlife ambassadors and one of my falconry birds. Uh, Belle is, uh, she's just turned, I believe, two years old now. So she's a, a, a full adult. Uh, she came out of a captive breeding out of Louisiana, even though Harris Hawks are primarily found in Southern Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. But she was captive raised in uh, Louisiana. So, you know, uh, sweet young little ladies uh, from the South are oftentimes called Southern Bells. And so she's my Southern Bell. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, what may sound like a bit of a boring subject. Now we can talk about whatever you like, but I wanted to talk about um, some of the diseases that we deal with with these animals. Uh, and a new one that has just hit North America is called rabbit hemorrhagic disease. I hope I pronounced that correctly, hemorrhagic disease. And it just showed up in Utah uh, on the 22nd of June. Here there's one case. And um, so we want to talk a little bit about about these about the diseases that we deal with. If you have questions, then then we're kind of here to, to answer those questions and talk about the wildlife rescue that we do and the animals that we care for. So uh, welcome everybody, and we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, any questions to start off with, DG? Well, I'm ch I'm uh, going to send a link out right now. The map of the affected areas. And maybe we can talk about, I mean, my biggest question is, this is something, the notice that we got is primarily concerned with domestic, but there are cases of wild rabbits as well now. Yeah, ba basically the hemorrhagic rabbit disease uh, originally started in Europe. It's a viral infection. It's highly, highly contagious. And, uh, hey, Belle, come on back up. It's highly contagious, um, and, and it's spreading fairly quickly across the country uh we've again we found it in in mexico at the beginning of the year uh it's been into arizona and several other states as well and just showed up on the 22nd of june so just literally a couple of weeks ago it, it we had one case here in utah in san peak county which is 100 120 miles from here and it, and it's a domestic rabbit breeder uh, from the information that I've received, they, he, he doesn't have a log as to where that rabbit came from, but it did test positive. Now, the problem with, the, with uh, a lot of these viral infections is, um, there is there's no cure for it. And, it. and if it gets into the wild, and it has in, in a few other places, if it gets into the wild, it's between 80 and 100% fatal to any rabbit that contracts it. And so this is a, a highly, highly contagious disease. It's extremely deadly. Um, we're dealing with something that all that it takes is a contact. The, the virus can live within the environment for, for a very long period of time. And so if you have one, let's say, cottontail out in a field that ends up getting infected, well, all of its feces, all of its urine, um, any contacts with, with that rabbit and any other rabbits uh, can, can cause the infection to spread. So, I, I mean, it's literally so contagious among these rabbits that if you walk through a field where there's an infected rabbit and you step on a place where, where the rabbit has urinated or defecated uh, in the field, and that's like everywhere, and you get that on your boots and you go home, and uh, and the next day or even a week later, you go for another hike in a different field, you will have spread the virus. And so that's that's how contagious this this particular virus is. Now we've had a lot of these come through. Um, there's a lot of diseases that we deal with on a pretty regular basis. A and uh, the reason I wanted to kind of bring this up is I wanted to kind of encourage people to understand uh, how to tell when an animal is sick, especially a wild animal. And this is kind of what we wanted to cover today. And, uh, you know, the bottom line when you're dealing with, with wild animals, yes, pretty girl, is any wild animal that seems to be tame is sick. Because wild is wild. They have a very strong fight or flight instinct. 
And so animals in the wild, if you come across any animal that just seems tame, and right now the rabbits, if, you, if you're walking out through the fields and you see a rabbit that doesn't run away, if it just kind of sits there, um, it's not tame. Uh, it is sick. And what you need to do when you come across a, a wild animal that seems to be tame, don't touch it. Leave it there. And please contact your local state fish and game uh, and notify them that, you know, that you've seen a sick skunk or a sick coyote or a sick rabbit or any animal that just seems to be docile and tame and, and uh, give them the, you know, GPS coordinates, whatever you can possibly do. Uh, to give them a good location so they can go out there and search the area. Like I said, uh, the hemorrhagic rabbit disease is new, but we have a lot of them that we deal with on a regular basis. It's part of the ecosystem. Uh, whenever there's a, a, an overpopulation of, of any kind of rabbit or any kind of animal in general, there I, I can promise you there will be a disease that will pop up and will knock the population down. Uh, and then once the population is knocked back, uh, the disease basically clears up and, and then the, the, the few remaining animals start to reproduce and, and come back. And it runs in cycles. Here in Utah, it's about every 10 years. Every, every 10 years, we have um, tularemia that comes through. And, and tularemia is, is, a, is a, again, a rabbit disease. It wipes out the rabbit populations. And when we have these kinds of things come through, um, rabbits are a, a, a keystone species. And so when the rabbit population goes down, they're a food source for many, many other animals. And so the other, like the predatory birds, when we lose the rabbit population, our eagle population starts to, to decrease because there's no food to feed the baby eagles. And, and, and uh, we have the same thing with small rodents. Uh, hantavirus has been certainly here in Utah, but it's been across the Western United States for, for years now, and that's transmittable to humans. And if you have a, an old barn or something and you have lots of mice, the mice will, will carry it, and, and you get the hantavirus from uh, the dust from the urine that is dried out. And so if you go into an old barn or you're going to clean out an old house and you're out there scrubbing like mad, um, you know, be aware of that. Wear a mask. Uh, use bleach, uh, because the dust that you, that you kick up from scrubbing and cleaning uh, will get those those the hantavirus particles into the air, and if it gets into your lungs, it it can it can make you very sick and can even it uh, occasionally be fatal. So, can birds of prey uh, be carriers as well if they come into contact with the rabbit and then like through? whatever else they deal can they be spraying around too that they can um ba basically uh, dogs can coyotes can any predators can if if a predator and, and again this is how it spreads if a predator finds a sick rabbit uh and you know they're looking for the, for basically um the the sick uh animals they're looking for the easiest meal so they come across a a, a rabbit that just sits there. Well, that's just easy prey for a, for a hawk like this or, or a, an eagle or an owl or something along those lines. And they catch the animal and they eat the animal. Their, um, their feathers, their feet, those kinds of things um, will be contaminated and they can be contaminated literally for weeks and maybe months with, with this new hemorrhagic rabbit disease and so if they go and they try to catch another rabbit and they get their foot on it, but they don't actually catch it, and the rabbit escapes, that rabbit can then become infected in a completely different location. And so these things do move through quite, quite fast. Can you talk about how it's just one more difficulty that all birds of prey face as far as finding food and then also how it affects Bell and Scout? You, you know, in, in the wild, the wild is a tough place to make a living. It really, really is. And and everything is based on the availability of food. And for a hawk like this, like I said, you know, cottontails and jackrabbits are certainly a big part of their diet. And if that food isn't available, um, they may survive, but 
the the young ones who don't know how to hunt well, uh, the the limited amount of food mean means that the nests, the clutches in the nest, the amount of babies they raise is smaller because they don't have the food to feed a larger clutch. And the babies that do survive the nest, uh, there are few rab- fewer rabbits, so they don't have as much opportunity to catch the food they need. And, and so what we usually find uh, is when a prey-based species like jackrabbits or cottontails or ground squirrels or, or, or prairie dogs or whatever, when their population goes down, there's about a two-year lag in the bird of prey population. And so when they're in the process of going down, then about two years later, we start noticing that, that the bird of prey population starts to decrease. And we also notice that it, with fewer rabbits, the coyote population starts to go down or the coyotes start to be more interested in, in feeding on livestock uh, more because the, their normal food source uh, is, isn't available to them. And so they have to adapt. So, so it's, a, it's a pretty rough situation for, for all of these guys. Now, as far as Bell and Scout are concerned, you know, my two, my two wildlife ambassadors and hunting birds, these guys, you know, they're guaranteed. We can take them out. We can let them fly. They can chase rabbits to their little heart's content. If they don't catch anything, that's fine. We, we just go home, and they're guaranteed food. So, so as far as the popu- losing the population just means that, they, that we go out in the field and they get bored because there's nothing for them to chase. But as far as being detrimental, it's not. OC Daredevils asks, are you going to keep hunting rabbits? I will keep hunting rabbits uh, as long as we don't have any signs of the new um, uh, virus here. You know, the I, again, you know, it's it's a balance of nature. So if there's, you know, if the disease isn't here, the rabbit populations are just fine, and and we let the birds, uh, let our falconer birds as well as the wild ones. Are, are doing just fine. And so far in Utah, there's only one case, and it's domestic, in a farm more than 100 miles from here. But if, while I'm, and, and this is one of the good things about taking these guys out and being out in the field with them, is we do have the, you know, we're out in the field, we're very much aware of the environment, and and people who actually, uh, falconers such as myself, to go out with these birds on a daily basis, um, we're the ones that are going to see whether we, we have issues with the rabbit population. You know, we're, we're the ones that are going to discover, oh, there's a sick rabbit over there and notify um, the, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources that we've come across a, a sick rabbit and, and be able to get the rabbit tested and determine whether the disease is in this area or not. So, you- so, so it's... Go ahead. Utah Wildlife, they send out notices to rehabbers and to falconers. So will they continue to do that as things progress or do not progress? We well, yeah, basically with these kinds of things, it's kind of like when the West Nile virus came across the country. West Nile came out of Africa, got into, got into the United States, started on the East Coast, and, and it took about 10 years to go all the way across the country. And, and so when West Nile virus was coming across the country, um, all of the states sent out notifications to wildlife rehabbers like myself and, and also to falconers and other people that, that, that hunt and they're out, out in the field and to let them know that uh, this is coming and, and to keep your eyes open. And, and I was given probably 100 test kits that any bird that came in with unexplained illnesses or death we were, we were to take uh, a, a swab of and send it off to have it tested. Just, just like the coronavirus here, when the coronavirus hit, you know, they basically geared up to have tests to, to determine who has and who ha- does not have it and where, the, and where the virus is. That's exactly what the, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and other states' fishing games and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does. But the problem is once it's here, once the West Nile was here in Utah and was pretty much established, um, then they don't test anymore. Then they basically said, okay, it's here. We can't stop it. There's no cure for it. There's nothing we can do other than to recognize that it's here. And we will lose some, some bird populations with West Nile. We will lose rabbit populations uh, with a hemorrhagic disease. 
and um, and then once it's it goes through and we do end up with a population that survives that population will then have what they call herd immunity and and then the only time that it really becomes an issue is if there's there's a stress population if there's a population let's say that there's so many so many rabbits um, that there's not enough food and winter time and and the rabbits are stressed and they're starving and they're not doing well in the the ones that are stressed will cause the the virus to mute to to come out and and basically knock down the population again and so that's that's exactly what we're seeing with with um, the coronavirus the same the same process which virus the covid-19 the coronavirus now are there instances where they've had to like proactively repopulate a species in a certain area or anything like that uh, for a viral infection, they've never repopulated, but we, we certainly have had, um, you know, situations uh, very, very much like um, DDT, which was a, a pesticide that we used that, that knocked uh, a lot of bird populations down, especially uh, birds of prey, and, and that, uh, to such a point that we needed to come back and, and put, a, put together captive breeding programs in order to reestablish uh, the, the populations back in the wild where they belong. And so we've done that. But as far as viral, I don't know, uh, yeah, I could be wrong, but I don't know of any situations where uh, a, a, a virus has come through that, uh, and, and as it goes through, it's, it's, you know, with DDT, because everybody used it, it was pretty much nationwide and even worldwide. Uh, but with these viruses kind of moved through knock a population down, keep moving, and that population that was knocked down, you know, a year ago starts to rebuild. And can you talk about how less prey seems to be much more difficult on larger birds like scout as opposed to bell the hawk? Well, yeah, the, the problem that we have with uh, the largest birds of prey like the eagles uh, is that their success ratio is so low in the, in the ability to catch to catch food that they spend a great deal of their time as scavengers, you know, basically picking up roadkill. And, and uh, the bald eagle is, is a scavenger and a fish eater, and the bald eagle spends a lot of time, you know, at dumps, digging through uh, human um, dump facilities, picking garbage, um, and, and those kinds of things. Where a hawk like Belle, she's much, yes, I'm talking about you, sweetie, pretty girl. A, a hawk like Bell, um, they're a little smaller, obviously, and they're s significantly more agile and far more efficient. Where my golden eagle on a really good year, I might catch 10 jackrabbits in a good year with my golden eagle uh, scout. Uh, with Bell, a good year, you know, it's 80 to 100 rabbits that she'll catch. And, and because she's so much more efficient at what she does. And so a hawk like this doesn't do a lot of scavenging. Where the eagles, because they're so big, uh, they do a lot more scavenging. And we've got a question from Jumper J. Not food-wise, but are they susceptible to the virus itself if they eat an infected rabbit? Right now, as far as we can tell, um, the the hemorrhagic disease has not jumped species, uh, and so the birds of prey, from what we can tell, do not contract the disease itself and neither do humans and so i don't want to panic anybody and have everybody says oh we've got another uh, another pandemic uh, on the doorstep no that's not what we're talking about here today this this disease is almost exclusively rabbits and and rodent type animals similar to that um you know it it has it has affected some pica which is which is a, a rodent that we that we have here in Utah, but we have them up on the mountains and in, in the rocky cliff areas. But um, they don't seem to affect dogs. They don't seem to affect coyotes. They don't seem to affect uh, humans. Uh, so if you're out in the field and you come across a a, a sick or or diseased rabbit, again, um, wash your clothes. That's a really good idea. Uh, wash your shoes. Uh, the bottoms of your shoes. You know, if you can put them in a, in a Thin little la uh, layer of a little bleach water on the bottom of your shoes. That'll that'll stop the spread. So use those boots somewhere else. It won't spread it around. Um, 
and so it's it's really easy for us to deal with it. Um, you know, like I said, we're not going to get sick. Now there are some um, diseases. There there was the uh, bird flu that came out a couple of years ago. That came from from uh, Asia. That got that got into some of the, to the waterfowl here uh, in North America, and and there was a big alert out for people that have birds of prey that that uh, have falcons that hunt du ducks and also for duck hunters to to be aware of the bird flu and that there were some indications that it could cross in over into humans and now i've never heard of it actually doing that but there was some concern we have a thank you to send out to randall cotton he just gave us a donation of two hundred dollars and he says oh my goodness thank you he says your videos are fascinating and your work is inspirational thanks so much and oh, you're very, very welcome. There's also mention of RHDV2 as a virus. Well, that's that's that is the virus. That is the the new the uh, hemorrhagic. Okay. That that's. Let me get. I got a piece of paper here, so I got my notes and make sure. Yes, it's RHDV2 is the technical abbreviation for the hemorrhagic rabbit disease. So that's what it is. And this person says, I've had to change how I'm raising rabbits completely. And unfortunately, part of the control was putting in a rabbit-proof fence around the property perimeter for wild ones. You know, and, and I, I certainly understand that. And, and again, it's, you know, we've had to do the same thing with uh, Newcastle disease. And when Newcastle hit in the, in the 70s and 80s, um, you know, they, they literally had to go through and wipe out a uh, whole poultry farms and, and and new uh new procedures had to be put in place to keep the newcastle from spreading in into the wild populations of of uh migratory birds uh so so that's kind of one of the price that we pay for uh for agriculture is that we do have to take into account um you know how do how do we not only make sure that that the animals that we raise are healthy, but also uh, to not not infect wild populations. And so I appreciate that you were willing to do that. Um, like I said, cur currently there's only one uh, reported case of the the virus here in Utah. It's domestic, and you know let's keep our fingers crossed that it doesn't it doesn't get into the wild population. Josh Dale asks, does this rabbit disease infect all species? Cottontails are the only ones we have in southern MN. Uh, it does. It, it can affect cottontails and jackrabbits, and it can also infect the, the snowshoe hares and, and um, pig, pygmy rabbits. And there, there's, there's quite a few different types of wild rabbits that we have here in North America. And though I, I don't think anybody knows exactly for sure but it is predicted that that it has the potential uh, to infect um, any any both wild and domestic rabbit populations. So, can you mention again what every person can do and why they need to know about this? Absolutely. What what everybody needs to do is just when you're out in the fields, just be aware that when you see and I and I, when you see. Um, an animal that's acting strange that is that's you know usually if you come across a a jackrabbit or a cottontail um you, you know the the second that you spot them they're running and they're running uh, as quickly as possible to get away and that's that's normal but if you come across a rabbit that just stands there and 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 doesn't run away and and allows you to approach it and it just stands there it's not tame it's sick and this goes for any kind of a wild animal. I, I've had situations here in Utah where we've had uh, both coyotes, foxes, and skunks and raccoons with rabies. And the rabid animal acts very docile and very tame. And, you know, and I, and I get phone calls, hey, there's this, uh, you know, there's this coyote and it's just kind of hanging around the house and doesn't seem to be afraid of anything. And, it's, and the first thing I say, don't touch it, stay away from it. And I contact um, the state authorities, um, and, and if they need my help, I, I, then I go and help them uh, capture the animal 
and test it for, for rabies. And we've had a few situations where, where it was rabies from an animal acting docile. And so with, with this hemorrhagic rabbit disease, um, if, you, if, you, if you're out walking and you see a rabbit that just, it's just ask and tame. And then, um, you know, please contact your local state fish and game and, and say, hey, there's a rabbit that's, that's acting like it's, like it's tame and, and it's, not, it's not being wild. Uh, and here's the location that, that we spotted it. And then when you, and then please, when you get home, um, you know, take your clothes off, wash your clothes, take your boots off, and take a, a, a water bleach um, cleaner. And, and um, you know, if you have a little bit of water in a, in a shallow pan that you can put your boots in and let them soak, or at least take some water bleach and spray your shoes that you, that you hiked around in uh, to kill that virus before you, you go back out into the field again somewhere else so that we can, we can prevent the, the spread. Is it possible that you may not see signs of infected rabbits themselves, but then later on throughout the season, the lack of birds of prey or unhealthy birds of prey might kind of be like a, a next step? Well, basically, uh, with this hemorrhagic rabbit disease, what you're going to find is the, the, from the time the rabbit is exposed um, to the time the rabbit is dead is very short. It's between uh, one to five days. So a rabbit that's, that's in, infected is going to get sick really fast. And, and so, you know, if, if you're hiking along and, and you see rabbits everywhere and they're running and they're acting completely normal, uh, especially for those that, that go out and, and hunt rabbits, and I'm, you know, I'm certainly not going to condemn anybody for going out and, and want, wanting to hunt rabbits and have a rabbit stew for dinner. That's, you know, I don't, that, that's not my job to, to do that. But anybody that wants to go out and, and recreate and enjoy the out, out of doors, uh, if you shoot a rabbit and it acted completely normal, the odds of it having the hemorrhagic disease is really minimal. Uh, but if you do come across a rabbit that just stands there and doesn't make any attempt to escape, um, then that's when you need to worry. So we're about 30 minutes in, so I think it's probably fair enough to open it up to, to all broader questions. And we've Absolutely. Got, we've got an interesting one here from Cannonball Films who asked, do your birds recognize words other than their names? You know, the, the truth of the matter is um, they, they, don't, they don't recognize a verbal language. There are a few cues uh, in, in falconry. There, there is a, a, a term that we use when uh, the, the quarry has been flushed. And so when, when your falcon's, you know, a thousand feet in the sky or my rabbit or my eagle is soaring or Belle is out, is out hunting and I flush a rabbit, when the when the the game's afoot, when the quarry's on the move, ninety nine times out of a hundred, the bird sees it before I do. But if I happen to be fortunate enough to see the rabbit before my hawk does, the the traditional falconry term is ho. And and so you're going through the brush, and if the bird's off at a distance and a rabbit breaks out from under your feet, then you you yell at the top of your lungs, ho. Ho! And, and that's the traditional falconer's call that alerts the bird that, that a, a rabbit is running and, uh, and, and gets the bird to look in the right direction. So do you think Bill's but, looking uh, around more right now after you said that? She's looking around saying, what do you mean, ho? What do you mean? There's no rabbits in here. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's very, very, very traditional. And falconry is very, is, you know, for, falconry is 4,000 years old. So it's a very, very traditional field sport. Yeah, you're looking like crazy. No, there's not one up there. I promise. Yeah, there's not, sweetheart. So, so basically, the the communication that we have is is not a verbal communication. It really is body language. Um, you know, she she hears my voice and she knows that I'm speaking words, but it's it's the the tone of my voice. That she that she re reacts to and not the words themselves. 
Is there a uh, falconry term for when there's a poodle around? Dumb, dumb. <laughs> no. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. <laughs> you, uh, they, I, I had to do that. I'm sorry. No, we, we, we have Cody, and, and he's this, the sweetest, most lovable thing in the world. He's a standard poodle, and he's our, our, our dear friend. And he, he's in the other, other room with, with Susan because uh, Belle doesn't like Cody. And if Cody comes in here, Belle will growl, growl at Cody and, and, and tell Cody off. But, uh, no, we, we tease Cody. Uh, you know, he's, he's adorable. We love him to death. But he's just not the, the brightest bulb in the package. We got a question from Pamela. She says, I got here late, so please forgive me if you already addressed this question. Will this spread to other states? I have a tremendous amount of wild rabbits living in and around my yard. It, it, it is highly possible. Uh, like I said, we have watched several uh, pandemics come across North America. Uh, West Nile, like I said, w was one that came across a few years ago. Uh, the Asian bird flu just a couple of years ago. And, and so, yes, it's, it's, it's very likely that uh, the hemorrhagic will, will move through. And the, and the reason for this particular podcast that, that we're doing is I, I want people to recognize what it is. And so if they do happen to come across a sick rabbit, then, then to do the right thing, and like I said, notify your local state fishing game. And then when you get home, like I said, clean your, wash your clothes and, and use bleach, uh, spray a uh, water bleach combination on your, on your boots. Uh, so, so that next time you go out in the field, you don't take the hemorrhagic fever to a different field. And, and so what I'm asking is everybody to, to be a little bit careful and, and, and not to, to spread it widely. Birdie Mom Carol asks, is that a loose feather on her left wing? Hard to tell. Uh, very, right there. Yeah, that is. She's molting. And you got another feather for us, huh, sweetie? No, oh, no, that's just one out of place. Okay, she has a lot. Of, she's right in the middle of her molt. That's why she kind of has little, little feathers sticking out everywhere. She, uh, and so, yeah, she's, uh, you know, e every day there's just a pile of feathers, um, either in her chamber or or here in the house on her perch, from from yes, from dropping all of her feathers. Oh, do you so want to? That's do you want to give a little sneak? A preview of the topic we have planned for the next live stream. Sure, uh, I've been getting a lot of uh, questions uh, about imping. Now, what imping is? It's the process in which, when a bird has a broken feather, that we can take uh, an identical feather that the bird has molted through in previous years, and and basically re-glue the good feather into where the broken feather was. And, and so uh, I'm go uh, our, our next uh, podcast, I, I want to sit down. I want to show you how we do it and explain why we do it and, and, and the benefits and, and disadvantages of, of doing that. And so that's, that's going to be our, our next subject. I'm going to cover imping in, in hopefully in, in good detail for everyone. And if anybody ever has questions, they can always send them ahead at, to uh, info at gowildlife.org. And L.W. Crafts says, does, or asks rather, does Bell ever catch European sparrows? Uh, Bell does not catch the European house sparrows. Um, the, the, the truth of the matter is the house sparrow is too small and too agile, but you know, Bell is, is much better at catching things, the, uh, you know, pigeon size up to pheasant size and, and ground squirrel up to jackrabbit. That's kind of the, the area in, in which she catches stuff. Now, there are, uh, there are a lot of, of birds of prey that specialize in catching those little house sparrows. Um, the, the, the male cooper's hawk catches a lot of them. The sharp shin hawk catches a lot of them. The merlin falcon catches a lot of them. They, these are smaller uh, hawks and falcons that are very quick and very agile that uh, hunt around people's backyards and do a tremendous job at helping to keep the, um, the European house, house sparrow 
English House Borough under, under control. We actually have a question that someone sent to our email. This is from Lori. She says, when you have another webcast, would you talk about the temperament of both types of eagles and why, if there's any reason, bald eagles bite more often than goldens? Absolutely. I can, we can do that right now. Here's the difference. The bald eagle is what we call a sea eagle, it's a, and the golden eagle is a booted eagle. They're two different kinds of eagles. And the bald eagle has a tendency to be a, a little bit more uh, of a group eagle. In other words, you, you very seldom see one bald eagle that there isn't another bald eagle or even many bald eagles in the area. Um, where a golden eagle is far more solitary. Now, because the, the, the bald eagle is, you, you find them in larger groups, they, they can be a lot more aggressive because they have to defend their food from each other. And so they're, they're a lot more aggressive when it comes to, to the food and those kinds of things. The golden eagle, being more solitary, doesn't usually uh, have the need to defend its, its meal as much. And so in, in falconry terminology, um, the, the golden eagle, or the, what we call the, a booted eagle, has a much more stable personality. Uh, in fact, of all of the, the birds of prey that I've ever worked with, and I've worked with thousands, uh, if handled correctly, the golden eagle is actually one of the gentlest and, and one of the most affectionate birds of prey that I've ever worked with. And Scout is a great example. My eagle Scout is a great example of that. The the bald eagle, because it it, uh, it genetically has more of a need to defend food, it's a little more aggressive. Now, you can get a bald eagle if handled appropriately and use it for programs, and it's fine. But, yeah, when I when I get eagles in to rescue, the golden eagles are, are just a little bit more calm. They're a little less likely to bite. I still get bit by golden eagles all the time. Um, but the bald eagle is just a little bit more likely, and so you, you want to just be that, just that much more careful when you're handling bald eagles. Um, you know, not only do you want to watch out for those feet, because that's, that's the most dangerous part. That's what they kill with but the, the bald eagle is far more likely to bite. And in birds of prey, the Harris hawk is very much like a golden eagle, and it has a more stable disposition. And the, the Harris hawk is much, much easier to deal with. If you have, a, let's say, a goshawk, they're far more likely to bite. And, and again, far more aggressive. So it's just the, it's just the individual bird's temperaments, um, and they need those temperaments in order to, to survive in the wild and fulfill their their biological niche that they fulfill. Can you talk about why you have a golden eagle as a wildlife ambassador as opposed to a bald eagle? The reason I have a, a golden eagle as a wildlife ambassador is because um, I, I don't want to just have a bird that does, that does nothing but shows and I and and uh, you know I, I in fact I've got a peregrine falcon that does nothing but shows she's she's mostly blind her name is Helen and it and I feel kind of bad and Helen can't be allowed to fly because if she 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 fly to buildings she would never be able to see food she if she flew flew off she couldn't find me in order to get back and and so you know but she's beautiful and she does programs very very well and we can use bald eagles for that but uh, ever since I was a child, I was always fascinated with the idea of not only falconry, but to be able to have an eagle that was my hunting partner. And a golden eagle is far better suited to be a falconry bird and, 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 and my hunting partner than a bald eagle is. And so certainly my first choice to fulfill both of my needs was a golden eagle. Uh, will I ever get a bald eagle for education? Uh, it's a possibility. Um, you know, if I have a bald eagle that comes in that is otherwise healthy but just can't uh, fly well enough or there's some other issue and, and it can't be returned to the wild, um, the, the problem is that I can apply, for, even though I'm the wildlife rehabber, I can apply for the permit to add it to my educational programs, but it really is up to the federal government as to where any animal that I rescue that can not be returned back to the wild, it's up to the federal government as to, as to what is done with it. And so, to be honest with you, the odds of me, even though I rescue them, being able to keep a bald eagle that can't be returned back to the wild is, is pretty slim. 
Sharon R. asks, we have two hawks that keep flying around my house. I have an outdoor cat. Will they go after it? Generally not. Um, most of the ones that you see flying around people's homes are, uh, uh, it depends on where you live. Here, here we have a lot of Swainson's hawks, and they're strictly a small rodent eater. And in the, uh, in the fall, we get a lot of Cooper's hawks coming through. And again, they hunt, they hunt almost exclusively birds. Uh, that you can get a red-tailed hawk, but to, to be honest with you, um, a red-tailed hawk, uh, a young red-tailed hawk that doesn't know any better, might get in in a in a fight with a cat, and it will never do it again. Be, because it uh, a cat is, is very very formidable with its claws, and um, you know that most of the birds learn very very quickly that a, that there's a big difference between a house cat. And a, and a rabbit. The, the rabbits uh, can't hurt, hurt the birds, where a house cat certainly can. L.W. Crafts asks, does your golden eagle hunt snakes? Does my golden eagle hunt snakes? He never has. Um, that doesn't mean that he won't. He just never has. Um, I did have a very, very large hawk. In fact, the largest hawk found in North America called a ferruginous hawk. And I had a big female ferruginous hawk that I was that I had exercised was flying. And um, the Ferruja's hawk basically flew about 100 yards away and dove down into the bushes and caught uh, a small gopher snake. And it swallowed the gopher snake whole. Now, birds of prey don't have a stomach like we do. They have a crop. And so they have a, a, they have a gizzard, which is a small muscle at their, instead of a stomach. And they have a, a basically a fleshy sac and it's right here. You can see how far my finger can go in here. That that will actually inflate out when my hawk has a big meal. That po that pouch just inflates and holds the food, and it will hold the food until its gizzard is empty, and then it, it'll put small bits of food down into its gizzard while it stores it up here in the crop. And so here's this hawk that's caught this this baby gopher snake, and it swallowed it whole. It was still alive, and so this crop this pouch was sticking out you know like the size of a, of a of an orange and it was wiggling and wiggling and wiggling and i'm just going oh you're gross and so i had to pick up the hawk and we went home and the thing wiggled in its crop for for quite a while before the snake was dead well we have more thanks to send out to ashley lynch just donated two dollars and she asked do you still hunt with bg the goshawk BG the goshawk is, is actually, we, we had uh, a bit of an accident with BG. And, and I, I haven't, I'll, I'll tell everybody, I haven't made this very public. Uh, BG, it was about this time of year. It was, um, it was the first part of July. And this was, what, two, two three years ago. It was the first part of July. And um, just like Bell, you know, this is the time when they're growing new feathers and they get all they want to eat. And to be honest with you, when they have all they want to eat, they won't come back to me because they're not hungry. Even though they may like me, the reason they come back is because they're hungry. And so BG had all, all that she wanted to eat. And I was asked to do one, one of my wildlife programs. And so I took um, BG and I took a falcon and I took uh, my golden eagle. And we did this... Um, uh, center for for mentally disabled adults that we did a program for them and unfortunately I was sick I had the flu I was feeling really really terrible but I had to go do the program because I promised that I would and so we did the show and we got home and I got scout put away and I got the falcon put away and I reached into the to the box where BG was and she had removed her hood now, the hood is what we put on the birds to help keep them calm when we're transporting. This is a hood right here. This is Belle's hood. You can see right there, that's Belle's hood. And this covers their head so that in, when we're transporting them, that they don't get frightened. They kind of blindfolds them. And so I put her hood on her, and she kicked the hood off. And so when I reached in the box, she literally ran up my arm, over my shoulder, and she was gone. And I searched for her for a month. And all I can tell you is that uh, she, she 
just to the east of me here, we have we have the the mountains up to ten thousand feet, and I'm sure she's up in the mountains, uh, because that's where the goshawks come from, and, and so she's she's back up she's up in those mountains, and hunting pine hens and squirrels and and that kind of stuff, but I was never ever able to retrieve her. And it kind of broke my heart to to lose her because she was a really really wonderful wonderful bird to work with, and and then since we couldn't get her back. We got we got Bell, so Bell is the hawk we use now. And we have more thanks to send out. Sabrina Lancaster donated fifty dollars, and she says, well, "Thank th you." She says, "Thank you for rescuing, teaching, and the YouTube channel." Well, thank you so much. I I appreciate you know you guys are wonderful, and it's because of you guys that that not only this channel exists, but I'm able to to care for all of the sick, injured, and orphan wildlife that we do care for. Uh, cur currently, um, just to bring everybody up to date, I've got a brand new golden eagle in. The golden eagle was about 13 weeks old, and it was separated from mom and dad and was starving to death out on the desert, horribly emaciated. Uh, took us a couple, three days of, of fluids to, uh, and to get it to, to the point now that it, it is now eating on its own, and it's able to sit up on a perch, so that's great news. And uh, about uh, three days ago, I had a barn owl come in, and again, separated from mom and dad early, young barn owl, and, our, and the barn owl is um, just last night ate on its own. And so the barn owl is coming along too. And so uh, a couple of more successes that, that we will continue shooting videos of and make them available for you guys and let you guys watch as we release them back to the wild. And can you talk about the ways that you do search for a bird that gets away? Well, w when they get away in this kind of a situation, because they don't have they don't have their transmitters on them, because we're not flying them, and so right right now, uh, Bell doesn't have a transmitter on her because she doesn't need one, because she's not out flying free. Um, when when we're out in the field, if she if she flies off some someplace and catches a rabbit, and she's completely out of sight. I have small transmitters that that um, have GPS trackers on them, and and it s sends the information to my phone, and I can see exactly where they are. And then all I have to do is walk over to to where and it it could be 20 miles away, and I could drive over and locate. And then once I'm there, I just walk over and pick them up. But in this kind of a situation, and this is a very rare situation, uh, this kind of a situation, um, you know. Sh I, I, we didn't have the, the GPS on her. Uh, she had the leather straps, and she could pull the leather straps out. And so all, all that would be on her is the little leather anklets, which doesn't, you know, hinder them in any way. And so the only thing that I could do, and I did this for about a month, is drive around the area and blow my whistle and swing the lure to see if I can get the, get her to come back. And And I did have this happen... Uh, once before, where I, I had a falcon, and and this sounds really bad. I had this falcon. We had just gotten back from flying the falcon, and I had the falcon at my at my business, and it would just sit on a perch behind the the counter, and I walked in the door, and I was attacked. I had I had customers everywhere. The phone was ringing, and everybody was you know wanted wanted my help. And, and so I uh, set my bird on the perch, and I did not put the swivel, which we've got right here, and I didn't have the bird clipped to my glove. I just set the bird on a perch in the store and everything and, and uh, trying to deal with massive amounts, and it's, it's all my fault, massive amounts of people wanting help. And, and, um, and somebody knocked over display, made a, made a banging noise, the falcon got spooked and and flew off the perch as someone opened the, the door to my to my pet store and the bird went right out the door and was gone and i whistled and whistled and threw the lure and i watched my falcon uh, circle and climb in some warm rising air got into to a thermal went up into the clouds and he was gone and so i again i spent uh, about 2 weeks at that time, um, every morning before work, driving around the valley, swinging the lure, whistling, uh, 
every evening after work, driving around the valley, swinging the lure, whistling. And, and, to, and after two weeks that the bird had been gone, I was out west of town and, and swinging the lure and blowing my whistle. And then, and then this bird comes flying in, lands on the lure and looks at me and says, hi. And he'd been gone for two weeks and he was fat as can be. He's been hunting, you know, birds for two weeks on his own. And I picked him up. I was so grateful to see him. And, and, uh, and we put his hood on and we went home. So in that case, I was able to get him back. But unfortunately, uh, with BG, um, we, nobody, you know, I was hoping that somebody would see her, maybe somebody that had pigeons. She'd end up, you know, land in somebody's pigeon coop or somebody with chickens or somehow that I would, that, that we would find her. But nobody ever saw her, No, uh, period. So all I can assume is it was quite warm and she went up on and she went to where it was cool which is basically up on the mountains to the east of us, and we never got her back. We have more thanks to send out to Sherry Cordova. She just donated $25, and she also says, I would like to get your book. Will you please tell me how? Oh, well, thank you for the $25, and um, you can go to our website. Uh, I've got, I, I always have one here with me, so there, there's the book. This is my book. It's called Healer of Angels. And the eagle that's on the front cover, that's Scout. That's my golden eagle. And this is 40 Years of Wildlife Rescue Stories and the Wisdom of Grandparents. It's a very fun read. And if you get, you can get the book at Barnes & Noble. You can get it at Amazon. But please, if you buy the book through us, uh, we get the profits, and the profits go to feeding the injured animals. And here's what I've done to the book. Look at this, guys. You see that? That is my eagle's footprint. So it's the only book autographed by a wild eagle. And again, the profits go to our rescue center. And so if you go to the website, gowildlife.org, uh, you can order the book off the website, or if you, you, or you can mail us a, a donation. And again, we ask a, a, the, I think the donation is $25, and then, and then the, the cost of, of shipping, I think that's $7 or $8 for, for the cost. When will there be a new book that Bell will autograph? When will there be a new book that Bell will autograph? You know, I keep getting asked by people about another book, but the truth of the matter is, um, you know, uh, this was a, a, a truly a labor of love that Susan and I put out. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a writer. And though I, I think the book came out extremely well, um, you, I, I, I right now just don't have the time to sit down and write another book. And um, so you're going to have to just put up with this one for now. Sabrina L. says, we used to have owls here every night. As more housing with bright lights were built, it's now rare to see owls at 3 a.m. Is there anyone to contact to study limit light pollution in an area? Light pollution is, is, is a real problem. Absolutely. Um, now, the, the problem is not just the light pollution for the owls. The problem is they have taken over um, the habitats where the owls hunt and feed. And so the, the, more, the more subdivisions that are put in, uh, the, the less land is available for the owls. Uh, also, you know, they, they need, uh, you know, big trees that they can nest in. The horned owl will sometimes nest on cliff faces, but that's, again, out Away, away from habitats, and, and so it's it's not just the light pollution, which is which is a problem. Uh, some cities uh, have taken this very seriously, and have put up new street lights that focus the light going down. Uh, there's there's things we can do to help limit light pollution, but it but it certainly is is an issue, and and I would um, there's lots of uh, information on the internet about uh, dealing with light pollution. And, and things that we can do to kind of minimize it. And then I would actually go to your city council and say, here's some suggestions on, on how we can basically get our night sky back. Um, you know, I, I live uh, a little bit out of town, and so I can sit out my backyard and see the stars, but it's not nearly as nice as it was 40 years ago when I first moved here when we were the only house out here. And so for me now to, to really go and enjoy the night sky, I have to drive um, 
about 15 miles out of town or go up to the Cedar Canyon Nature Park where the mountain blocks the, the city lights to, to, to really enjoy the night sky. Uh, Joy P. is curious about some of the distinctions between hawks and eagles. Okay, well, the, the, the biggest one here in North America is um, our, our largest hawk uh, is, is less than half the size of our smallest eagle, which is the golden eagle. Uh, and so size is, is a big thing. The, the eagles basically have, uh, you know, broad wings. They have uh, a, a little bit shorter tail. Their head structure is a little bit different. Uh, than most of the hawks, but this this Harris hawk right here looks very very eagle-ish. The Harris hawk is really built, even though it's much smaller. It's very, it's really built uh, quite similar to to a golden eagle. Um, and the, and then like I said, the two eagles, the bald eagle with the white head and white tail, uh, is a sea, sea eagle. It's a fish eater. Golden eagle is a booted eagle, where it has feathers coming down to the top of the foot, where the hawk's leg is bare. The uh, the golden eagle has feathers down to the top of its foot. Uh, the ferruginous hawk has feathers to the top of its foot as well. So, so structurally, the eagles are a little bit more broad. But again, we do have uh, what we call broad wing type hawks, which are quite broad. But they're not nearly as big. So, by the way, the barking is in Arizona, not in Cedar City. Other people can hear the dogs. Uh, L.W. Krauss asks... I have never even heard, or says rather, I have never even heard a great horned owl. And Sherry Evans asked, Martin, do you have problems with egg laying with Bell? Do I have trouble with egg laying with Bell? No, actually we don't. Um, they, in, or, you know, in order to encourage egg laying, well, she's only two years old and she won't really be old enough to breed for a couple of more years. So that's not an issue. But even if she is the appropriate age, I had a female Harris hawk uh, named Sierra uh, that uh, she and I were together for 16 years. And, the, and um, she, she basically, you know, that's very, very old. And uh, she got arthritis and, and she passed away. But the very last year, her 15th year, she laid one egg. And so they don't generally lay unless they're in a breeding situation where the, the, the laying has a lot to do with the courtship that they go through. And so they, they, they don't just lay to lay like some other birds will do. We've got a question from, looks like, Anani. She said, or he or she says, Rodin Pro is in Indiana. Do you need us to send you some, send some to you for the Eagles? Rodin Pro is the, the company that I use uh, to provide frozen rats, mice, and quail for the eagles and hawks and falcons that we care for. And we do have um, the ability to, for you to go and, and purchase a, a Rodent Pro gift certificate for us. And if you purchase the gift certificate, then we have the credit. And so, like, uh, uh, a couple of days ago, I, I got, um, what, a thousand frozen mice from Rodent Pro. Uh, shipped to me. And so uh, every time I need a shipment of frozen food for the animals, we contact Rodent Pro and we use the gift certificates uh, to, to pay for the rodents. And so, yes, absolutely. But you don't have to go through all the trouble of ordering rodents for us. Uh, just purchase us a gift certificate that we can use for the for our next order. Okay, so we're at the hour mark. Any, any famous last words? Uh, just Thanks, guys, and uh, and please, uh, like I said, this this whole video was was about dealing with uh, uh, some of the diseases and things and sick animals that we deal with. So again, wild is wild. Please, you find an animal that's acting a wild animal that's acting tame, it's sick. Please do not approach it. Contact your local state fishing game. Give them the best description that you possibly can, and and if you've been in an area where there's been a sick animal, please come home, disinfect your clothing uh, so that next time you go out in the field, you don't carry whatever uh, infection into the field with you and infect an, another group of animals. So you guys are incredible. Thank you so much for, for putting up with us. Belle, you got any last words? 
for everybody? No? No last words? Thanks, DG, and thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.